If you ever wonder how people ended up drowning witches or killing neighbors in civil wars or following Chrissy Teigen on Instagram, you could bet hysteria was the driving force. For years, Greg Gutfeld has entertained and edified audiences by hosting Fox News Channel shows such as Red Eye, The Five, and The Greg Gutfeld Show, and by authoring bestsellers such as How to Be Right, Not Cool, and The Joy of Hate. Now the 55-year-old punk rock fan has just published The Plus, Self-Help for People Who Hate Self-Help a funny yet serious book about becoming a better person. Basically, it's impulse control for people who have options that lend themselves to doing negative things. In a wide-ranging conversation, Gutfeld tells reason why he thinks Americans have so many problems controlling our worst impulses, how we will eventually emerge better off from the COVID-19 lockdowns, and why we will re-elect Donald Trump in November. Greg Gutfeld, thank you for talking to Reason. My pleasure, Nick. It always is a pleasure. Uh, uh, you know, it's a pleasure before it begins, and it gets less and less pleasurable as the time goes on. Uh, yeah, let the me. The regret goes up. The yes. pleasure goes down, and the regret goes up. That's uh, you know that I, uh, also known as Saturday Night, right? Yes. Um, your new book, uh, which I read with pleasure and joy in a steaming hot uh, afternoon, actually in Washington Square Park in New York, in you know quarantine New York. The plus self-help for people who hate self-help. Why did you feel a need to write a self-help book right now? First off, I I, I love the fact that you read this book in public in, oh, yeah. in downtown <laughs> New York and you didn't get jumped. Um, you know what it was? I um so I didn't have a contract for uh, I, I haven't I had a contract for a book, but I didn't have to write one for another year or so. Mm -hmm. But I had all these weird proposals that were all like linked. Stuff about social media, stuff, stuff about cancel culture, mobs, and all this stuff. And it was all kind of bothering me. So I started writing these proposals as articles. And then I realized I'm really tired of hearing me complain. Hmm. So then other people must be tired of hearing me complain. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm thinking about how to make my life better. And it, th this idea was like, well, why can't I create solutions for these problems and is so, there a solution yeah so i mean the the controlling metaphor the the big idea in the book is in the title the plus and you talk about you know basically you can either be a plus or a minus uh, right. not just to yourself but to the people around you can you talk a little bit about uh you know flesh that out a little bit and uh explain the origins of this uh, insight, which, I, and I don't think I'm overselling it when I say, you know, this is probably since the invention of gravity, the discovery yeah. of gravity and the invention of fire. This is probably the third most important thing since the, and also the Beatles anthology record being released around 2000, 2001. Yes. Well, and dental floss. Yes. I put dental floss up there. There's nothing more pleasurable than using dental floss. But anyway, yes. you are, cor you are correct. So have to <laughs> now okay <laughs> basically it's impulse control for people who have options that lend themselves to doing negative things so i need that and i think a lot of people need that maybe back when religion was a bigger deal this would come off as super obvious the idea of thinking before you act and wondering <laughs> before you send off that email <laughs> or that text or saying yeah. that thing to your spouse, you wonder, is this a plus or a minus? Like, is what I'm about to do going to make things a little bit better, or a little bit worse? Most people would call that impulse control. It, would be, it, it was, a, it was a, a practice of improving yourself because you knew you were flawed. And that's what religion was for. Religion basically said you were screwed up and you need the, you need the Ten Commandments, you need, these, you, you need rules. But we've, we've jettisoned all that. And so... As you get older and you become, I'm going to, I mean, I'm not going to, as, as I became more successful in life, options present themselves in which impulse control becomes a huge deal. And I, I think, by the way, I think impulse control or lack thereof is a huge deal right now, as we're seeing across America. That we've had how, to how do you mean? How do you mean, um, you know, impulse control? Are you telling me that uh, you don't think that people who are rioting, not people who are protesting and spending time in writing down placards and, and organizing, but, you know, rioters and looters, you don't you think that they have an impulse control problem? I think anybody who commits crimes knowing that they uh, 
in the long run, it doesn't pay. We were taught that. That's yes. some kind of impulse control. I would put myself in that. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know what a great, a great example of lack of impulse control is drinking, knowing you're going to have a hangover. The hangover, you know, that's, that's the most obvious way. And I mean, looting is a destruction of your community. And, it, it, and it, it, I think it's also a crime of uh, opportunity. They, you know, the, the, what happened in Chicago happened because they knew they could get away with it. But there would be some kind of impulse control that would say, you know, this is wrong. There are people that own these businesses. There are people that work here. I have friends that work at this place. They're not going to be at work on Monday because the store won't be here. This is the second time we've looted this place. They're not coming back. The insurance is no longer going to be there. It's like, it's like impulse control. I feel like we're, we're living in a stage where we see impulse. We say we see moral judgment or any kind of judgment is somehow uh, bigoted or or uh, or or mean. What about uh, Donald Trump? Does he have impulse control problems? I think so. I think so. <laughs> but thankfully, it has, it's almost entirely verbal. Yeah. <laughs> like he doesn't start wars. Right. You know? He's not like the, he's not the he's not, we've had this discussion that uh Generally, uh, everybody gets mad at Donald Trump about his personality, um, but that does, his personality doesn't lead to death. I would rather take a guy with a thousand upsetting tweets uh, a week over a guy that creates a thousand body bags. You know, and that's and, and I know that it's not that's the prison of two ideas. I know that. Yes. Yeah. Which is a happen. great concept in the book about you. You talk about the prison of two ideas and and you emphasize that that journalists especially. But and, and I think it's more than journalists, but journalists especially love the idea that it's it's this versus that. It's always yes or no. It's always binary. So, yeah. And, um, I, and I just did it now. I yeah. did it now. But because it is such a relentless criticism for four years and it doesn't change. It's like, dude, okay, we get it. Trump's obnoxious. Trump's tweets piss you off. But if you wake up every day surprised by Trump or by Trump's words, it's like being surprised that there's we wake up to uh, a sunrise right. or that, you know, it, it is something that is going to be there until it's not. Well, both the sunrise and Trump uh, and Trump Trump are orange, right? Exactly. Um, let me- I saw that the moment I saw uh, yeah. the brain move. Can I, uh, you know, before I, I, I want to, you know, stay on on the self help question a bit um, for a second. But um, you know, one of the things you you said, like, you know, it's it's about being plus rather than minus in like the myriad all of the different interactions you have every day. Can you, you know, can you make people around yourself? Can you make yourself feel better or do better in each interaction? I want to I want to uh, cut to the chase though because we're you know we're roughly the same age and we have a lot of similar tastes and we you know we both were raised uh, Roman Catholic went to Catholic right. schools and things like that. I know for myself and I, I don't want to speak for you but I think I know you well enough. Like the, you know a lot of the stuff you like you're wearing a Melvin's t-shirt. A, you know there is so much negative energy that mm -hmm. I draw on every day. You know and and this is what I liked about punk. This is what I liked about the Sex Pistols and the Clash and the Angry Samoans mm -hmm. and groups like the Melvins and whatnot. That you know there's energy in being negative. Right. Um how how did you flip that switch because it is also true that if you're pouring acid all the time eventually you know it starts getting on your shoes and it starts eating on your feet and moving up your body how did you flip negative energy into uh into being a plus that is a great question because i've been thinking about it a lot in terms of music that you're right okay so i loved punk from i mean yeah. i loved everything from the mid 70s on and a lot of it's a lot of it was nihilistic <laughs> I, I, which you know, i mean is so and that is so great about it you yeah know? it it's is like, and and i'm wondering but the we here's the <laughs> thing i don't know if it influenced me because i don't know if i understood the lyrics at the time like okay right. so I, I my favorite band was the clash and they were like they they dressed like you know uh um outlaw communist cowboys right right and uh sand they, they, <laughs> their third their triple album was called sandinista right i mean and i and i'm like i don't know how old i was but i was 1980 so I was 16 and I, I didn't even know i knew what the sandinistas were yeah. i had to do a report on something uh for re my religion class at sarah on um, <laughs> central american uh, uh politics and religion. yeah so uh, this is like it's fallen into your lap right the, yeah, the yeah. class but, but then yeah, but so now i have i uh, bought a, a record player and i'm listening to 
a lot of this stuff. And I'm like, going, I don't like this. <laughs> I, I don't. And the great thing about the Melvins, I have no idea what they're singing about. And I think that even uh, King Buzzo has said that it's only it's like he chooses words for how they sound. And then the same thing with Mike Patton chooses lyrics based on how the words sound. And if and, it, and if you are reading into this, although I do think that the the the, the last Buzz of King Buzzo album he's doing with Trevor Dunn actually has some lyrics that are uh, that are pointed. You know, but the here, the other thing though is I am almost like I would say I've moved to eighty to ninety percent instrumental electronica ambient music because I don't I find that lyrics I don't want other people's thoughts in my head I was never like that I love having thoughts in my head but I don't like other people's thoughts in my head it's too crowded in there I don't need to be I don't need Billy Joe Armstrong telling me that. You're an idiot. You're an American idiot. Yes. Right? He's if a great we're guy. allowed to still use nationalist terms like America. I love, but that's a great album, you know, yeah. uh, American Idiot or whatever. It's uh, so it. I mean, to me, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, as I was reading your book in Washington Square, being egged and pelted with garbage right. by all the opioid losers who are not social distancing in Washington Square <laughs> Park, I was thinking of this irony and this paradox that. There is so much great negative energy coming out of punk, but then, you know, but then you you need to do something with that energy. And I, and right. that's what I like about the book. Uh, one of the points that you make in the book that I want to uh, kind of talk about is you at, at some point, and I'm going to butcher the exact quote, which is much better worded than what I'm going to say. But you, you basically said, you know, it's really important to take a couple of moments every day and recognize that when you get all pissed off and bent out of shape over politics, that it's not that important or that's not the limit of your life can you talk about what you mean by that general insight again i, I apologize for paraphrasing it so if far. i forget that the people that i'm talking to aren't in my profession or i'm just hanging out uh and then i realize that what i'm talking about they have no idea what i'm talking about like i could be and, and it's like oh i go oh geez uh i can't believe trump love and they go like well what happened and, the, and like i like i have friends that work in uh in auto in like classic cars mm -hmm. and they like they, they know i do a show and i have friends that are in rock bands they know i do a show but they don't even watch it. and it's like so it's like i don't even bother with hey did you check out the show some people do but generally mm -hmm. a lot of uh, my aside from my family you know and some friends you know it's like people are doing their own thing they have more of an allegiance and an emotional connection to sports way more than anything mm -hmm. political they start thinking about politics in october maybe um i think Trump has been different because he's been so magnetic that everybody, including the people that love him or and hate him, are drawn to him. I don't think there's ever been right. a personality like this. Right. Or, like, or they're pushed away like a magnet, like you either yeah. get stuck to him or you, you can't yeah. even get close to him. I guess the word is polarizing, which is an overused yeah. word. But uh, I think, you know, uh, I under, like when I'm around people, uh, nobody talks about politics unless they want to talk about it with you because you are in it but generally it's not there and then also it's like I, it's it's weird okay so if you're not living in the city you can get engulfed in social media and think the world's going to end right the world's end you're watching chicago manhattan uh, seattle portland whatever but then you go outside and if you're living anywhere outside of a city there's no impact whatsoever you can walk out walk around the trees and i do this i i, I got i bought a cabin in the woods a couple of years ago and it's like it's a universe uh, Wait, well, I'm sorry. Did you say it's the Unabomber that you yes. are now going to be the Unabomber? You're living in a shack in the yeah, woods. Yeah. Here's an out of context. Yeah. <laughs> part of this interview. You know, he had some good points there. You can put that in there. Living out in the middle of nowhere is really good for your brain. However, yeah. you know, I can't like okay, going outside. is the best way to get away from this stuff. Mm -hmm. The only problem is if you're living in Manhattan or if you're living in these cities, it, that cloud still follows you. Also, if you're um, in the public eye, uh, you can be canceled whether you're on Twitter or not. Just because you don't look at Twitter or Facebook doesn't mean there's you know 50 people that are trying to generate this idea that you're a scourge and you need to be completely blackballed. And but in in the book, I mean, uh, I, and if I, if I get your position wrong, please correct me. But um, I mean, you're not saying that people 
shouldn't be, you know, going back and forth on Twitter. And, you know, and if you say something, you might, you might get praise or you might get criticism. But what you're talking about is a kind of over the top cancel culture where people are not even, in, you know, they're not interested in talking about ideas or even agreeing or disagreeing. It's about cutting, you know, cutting somebody's knees off yes. at every given moment. It's a power move that uh, people who perceive no power or think that they have no power uh, engineer in this matter gives them a sense and it's maybe fleeting, but uh, if I got rid of, I mean, I'll get people that are trying to come after me and, uh, and they'll be, uh, I got you, you're going down. It's like, who cares? It's like, what is this going to do for you or your family? I don't understand this. And maybe, maybe there was, maybe I got a thrill out of this. I don't know. I don't think I ever did. I think I've always pretty much defended people who even I didn't like. And, uh, and these people never, almost never returned the favor. Could you, uh, yeah, awful. well, you, you, you tell a very good story and, uh, you know, Ed, like all good self-help books, you are the hero of every story you tell. Exactly. Uh, but, but you talk about how you were wrong about the, the Covington Catholic, uh, school kids, uh, Nick yeah. Sandman, uh, the, yeah. you know, the big showdown between the Vietnam war vet who was not quite a Vietnam war vet, American Indian protester versus, you know, punky, uh, MAGA hat wearing, uh, you know, upper middle class kids from a, uh, Catholic school outside of uh, Cincinnati and Covington, Kentucky. What did you get wrong and what did you learn about kind of eating your words on that that instance? Well, the scenario is a familiar one for me. At Saturday, I'm drinking at a, a place <laughs> and, the, and I've noticed that my tweets don't get drunky. They just get more frequent. So if, I, yeah. if I'm sober and I'm tweeting, <laughs> I will tweet maybe twice a day at the most and they'll yeah. be pretty good. But then if I'm drinking, I'll have like, Ah, like 10 and they're they're not like stupid right. they're exactly the same but the fact that you do them more frequently increases the <laughs> risk for trouble so it's your sponsor crazy. your 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 sponsor has like a twitter uh, uh notification like yes. oh my god greg hit three in an hour i've got to do it in yes, he's definitely he's definitely on yeah. the rosé <laughs> <laughs> but um so i was there and so i'm sitting there it's like one o'clock i'm working on probably this book and uh, and I'm watching the Covington stuff, and there was a thing that I did, which is like ridiculous. Which is like, it's it's a, it was a strategy. So I'm watching this, and I go, well, you know, if people are going to trust me in my criticism, I have to police my own side too, right? I have to, I can't just go after Joy Behar or Bill Maher. I've got to go after this punk, this punk in D.C. Making fun, you know, I, so I said something, wow, I think I wrote something like this guy, this kid should be taken home without supper and spanked or something like that. And then, of course, like two hours later, we find out that, you know, anybody like there's a couple of weak human weaknesses. Once the willing, the, the desire to be first, you know, oh, I'm going to get there first. Then there's this mimicry uh, that you look around and see what other people are doing and you do that, um, which is the mob kind of thinking, which I actually hate. And I think I kind of played a role in that in a tiny little way. Um, and then um, just the idea that you think that all your, all of your thoughts are worth hearing. Like, why can't I just shut up? Don't, I know what you're saying. Shut up. I am going to shut up after this interview. But for now, why, why do I have to tweet? Why do I have to? Why do I feel like they're not even paying me? This is the stupidest thing about Twitter, Nick, is that I can be more likely to be fired for doing something free <laughs> than, than doing what I'm paid to do because I'm sitting on Twitter and, you know, I'm like, I'm, every time I'm you tweeting, you're kind of jumping off a little cliff, you know, so stupid. I don't understand why I'm doing it. But anyway, when I realized I was wrong, I didn't, uh, I, I went out of my way. I wrote a, a piece on it. I did, I think I did a monologue on the GG show and a monologue on the five because I felt that the restitution was necessary and perhaps it would help. If people saw that, hey, I, I'm, I'm going out of my way to say I'm an idiot, that other people will like, oh, OK. That is no, it's, I, it, I mean, it's it's a really nice moment in the book. And I, I remember that kind of in real time. But I think uh, it's it's a great example of trying to, you know, to walk the uh, walk that you're uh, uh, this, a terrible line. I'm sorry to finish it this way, to walk <laughs> the walk that you're talking in the book. Um 
How does how does the you you note in the book you started writing this I think in January thereabouts so it was before the the COVID nineteen pandemic and lockdown how does that fit into um, the scheme like you know because one of the things that the pandemic has done is really I mean everybody's kind of pissed off nobody trusts anybody because we're being told you know one day we're being told by Tony Fauci. Wear, don't wear a mask. They don't do anything. Then the next day, oh, now you really got to wear a mask. And I was lying to you. And he's the least objectionable figure right. in this in this whole drama. Obviously, uh, you're good friends with him if you call him Tony. Uh, oh, well, t- you know, I, as an Italian American on my mother's side, I have you know, there's a club that we belong to. So, okay. um, but but what I'm saying is, um, you know, this is a particularly bad moment. I mean, on top of everything else that's happening, you know, this has really rubbed things raw. How does how does the pandemic, um, uh, you know, intersect with being a plus or a minus? What what are the ways to do that? Because you you take a bunch of pot shots uh, at Governor Andrew Cuomo, Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York, rightly, I think. But, you know, everybody is mad. Everybody's angry at somebody. Yeah, you know, uh, the book went. The book was sent off to the printer before the pandemic, and I pleaded with them to add that first chapter on it to talk about it because there were ideas in the book that apply directly to this issue, including the prison of two ideas, where you're faced with we're not faced with a choice of lockdown or back to work, and then and if pe- back to work people will die, lockdown economy collapses. That's the prison of two ideas that we're constantly going over every single day. And it's like, no, we, we, we have adjusted phases that can go back and forward and lateral and vertical, whatever. Yeah. But the other thing too, that I try to say, and, and to your point about blaming and not blaming is if people uh, made decisions you, uh, with, with the, the information that they had, and then the information later proves them wrong, uh, you can't really blame them for taking a, taking a stance. You could, especially if they change it immediately, if they go like, um, like so many doctors, including Fauci said, uh, no, keep, you know, go on that cruise. I think Fauci right. said, keep going on that, on those cruises and you don't need to wear a mask. And then of course all that changes. Yeah. And you realize the reason why they were saying don't wear a mask is they didn't want to run on masks, right. which is what you were kind of seeing anyway. <laughs> so they, t- so they, they, they basically tried yeah. to lie to, to help. And, and, and is a burden, so to speak. And then they, then they backtrack and say this, so nobody trusts them. But I, 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 I say that you have to, you can't keep pointing fingers. Now, the reason why you can point fingers at de Blasio and Cuomo is the fact that, oh, that's a weird noise, uh, that uh, de Blasio was wrong on almost everything he was saying and going after people who were trying to do right. And also just the rest home thing is just idiotic. And, I think what bothered me most about Cuomo is CNN kind of because they have his uh, his brother and that they had the brother show, uh, mm-hmm. the Smothers Brothers. There is a sick joke in the Smothers <laughs> Brothers. Yeah. Why did that, I think uh, of that? Yeah. But I'm not going to make that mom joke. Mom always killed you first. Yes. Something. I'm not going to. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. I'm not going to make. But so you have these the, you have these guys being lauded by the media while 6,000, 6,200 yeah. people died in the rest homes in New York who didn't right. have to, right. and, and they're lecturing us on going outside and wearing masks, and then they just you know, shunt all these, uh, all these contagious patients in. So um, assigning blame, you gotta be, if somebody has some skin in the game and took a risk and said, do this, do that, I don't get, I, I, and they t- end up being wrong, that's, uh, as long as they change and they, and they adapt, yeah. that's how it works with a pandemic. You don't know. And by the way, we are all gonna go back to like this, this death rate that's going to be really low once we realize how big the how yeah. contagious it was. I mean, it was like I think it was like in March. I think it was the death rate not nationwide was like six percent. Now it's hmm. overing at one, and I bet it'll it's going to go at one percent. By the way, still high right. of infections, and it was probably go down even more as we realize how large this thing is. Yeah. Uh, but so everything keeps shifting, and we have to be fairly compassionate. To people when they are wrong, but I really don't like people who don't say anything until afterwards, and then they armchair quarterback, you know, and and uh, and saying, "Oh, you know, it looks like you, you really had a terrible plan." It's like, well, what were you doing? You know? Do you think, um, you know, uh, and I want to talk uh, briefly about how how you think that we might end the polarization that you know seems to be everywhere. 
Um, but before we do that, can do you think things are worse now? In the book, you you do talk about you know kind of media and social media and new forms of media, the hyper politicization of everything. Um, is it worse than say you know in the late seventies or something when you know you started being conscious of of a kind of adult world of discourse and you know people. People likened uh, Reagan to Hitler. People likened uh, Bill Clinton to Hitler. Right. You know, people, you know, everybody, everybody has, you know, five minutes. Uh, you know, Andy Warhol was wrong and in, in the future, everybody will be likened to Hitler for 15 right. minutes. Um, is it worse? Is it yeah. worse? Um, and if so, why is it worse? And the irony, the, the one person who wasn't likened to Hitler was Hitler. <laughs> Somehow he, got, he he escaped that. Yeah, he, took, well, he's a wily old fox, right? Yeah, still yeah. alive in Argentina. Uh, yes. You know, um, uh, but is it is it? Do you think it's actually worse than it used to be? Um, I think it's and, just more. Uh, there's more platforms mm -hmm. to make it feel overwhelming, and I think the I think uh, the profit model for news because of social media is now about discontent. It's like they realize they've done the research. They know that the clicks are driven by that inside feeling of like, ah, and it's yeah. like, um, and I, I, I just saw a, a great story uh, about, it was a headline from an English newspaper and you spent time in England. So you know how the press works there, which is kind of paradigmatic of this, but it was about how uh, a guy said that when he was a fat kid in the seventies, Ellen DeGeneres fat shamed him. I, I know. So I mean, now we're going to go back. <laughs> we're going to go back. Okay. So did you, I fight I'm pretty sure I teased somebody in third grade. I'm not sure I was teased, but I mean, like that. This is where we're going, and they actually print that art. They print that oh. article. Everything is publishable. <laughs> Everything is publishable. Which I thank God for on my own, uh, you know, for my own outlets. But yes, it's it's a bit much. Talk, tell me, uh, it, let's we'll wrap up in a couple of minutes here. But um, how do you propose? to reduce polarization or, or, you know, to escape the criminal, the mental criminal justice reform to get us out of the prison of two ideas. Greg Gutfeld. I do. I do believe that the first thing we need to do is is conquer uh, cancel culture, because I think mm -hmm. uh, I think that that keeps people scared. Uh, so we need to share the risk. Everybody needs to defend other people that they don't even like. And I know that's altruistic. There's also the idea of mutually assured destruction. Which, you know, if somebody comes after Nick Gillespie by going to Reason Magazine and saying, you employ uh, Nick Gillespie who uh, cannibalizes, you know, I don't know, well, humans. And then, because okay. uh, you are human. And Thank then you. you have the, I know, it's not often I can pay yeah. you a compliment. That, that, <laughs> but, uh, but then you have the right to call that person's place of work. So I feel like I would love to see a law, although I don't like laws, like people who come after the cancer, we need to know where they work. I would love that. But I think sharing the risk is the best is the is the only way we're going to get through this. Um, and education, which is I mean, you and I are probably in the same page as we need a complete overhaul because we are creating zombies and uh, they're coming into our human resources. They're leaving the campuses. So we need we need innovation. I always I've said this a couple of times. What Peloton did to education, I mean, what Peloton did to gyms, blank is to education. We fill in that blank, we change everything. Like Peloton, the gym, and change the way people exercise, at least for now, for rich people who buy things first. Then, do, then, you then, think, then um, do you think that the, the lockdown and the quarantine, which, you know, it seems to be sticking around longer than I think a lot of people expected, um, do you think that might be one of the benefits that it is, it's, you know, even as we move more online, it's also kind of forcing people to rethink things. If, if we're Peloton can pull that yeah. we're, we, we, we're shaking the box on all things, including just like walking around the city. You can walk around the city with a drink in your hand now in, in Manhattan. Right. And I don't think that's going away. The open, uh, the open dining up until I guess until winter. Now, but that might end up being permanent. I think you know, incorporating like online studies with in classroom stuff is going to be mm -hmm. permanent. But maybe we can even build on that. I think there's going to be a lot of things, like a lot of the, the working at home stuff and the Zoom stuff is going to be helpful. I do all my meetings at home, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and security is changing. So many weird things are changing. Uh, oh, I'm, I mean, like, we're not going to be handling money much. We're not going to be dealing with people. 
if at all. I mean, remember all those restaurants that they're, they're opening in airports three years ago where you just go to the thing, you type in your yeah. eggs Benedict bottle of wine. That was right. mine. And then it would just, somebody would come out and drop it there. That's the way it's going to be. You know? and that, that's, that's a beautiful vision of the future. Where, hey, here's, yeah. a, here's a weird thing. Just did it, Have you rethought about eating out as like a weird kind of artificial pleasure because now you're at home and you're going like, how much money did I spend thinking that I had to go out and eat? And now we're t- I'm talking to somebody with no kids uh, and a young wife and I just, we just go out. And I'm like, what? it's like now I'm living like a normal person. I go like, and then I walk by restaurants and I go, oh, no, I'll just go home and cook something now that they're open. I wonder if when you break a habit, when you break a habit, can you, like even with watching sports, how hard is it to get back into it? Like, you know, when you, yep. when you love a team like the 49ers and then they have two bad seasons and then did you break that habit so you don't come back to them or, or whatever? Do you see my point? I don't no, know. No, I, I mean, I think you're right. And I guess the question now is we need to get busy on figuring out what comes next because we're, we're kind of at the end of the road. Yes. We are the clash circa cut the crap uh, <laughs> clash. We know oh, that, the, you know, that the future is unwritten and we need to come up with new bands. Big, well, uh, Big Audio the, Dynamite is reforming, so there's yes. good news for that. Um, what, you know, in, in the book, uh, in, in your previous books, which I've, I've read and enjoyed, um, you talk a lot in, in previous interviews uh, and on your shows, you talk a lot about the uh, influence of Andrew Breitbart um, on you and, and kind of as a culture figure where even people who are on the other side of the political fence actually have adopted a lot of the insights and a lot of the temperament and kind of sensibility of Andrew, um, but uh, of the light Andrew Breitbart. In this book, you talk a bit about Scott Adams, uh, or yeah. he comes up pretty regularly and you know he's the, the creator of, of Dilbert. Um, he is a somebody who has been identified as a Trump supporter even though he is pretty much at pains to say he expected Trump to win for he predicted that Trump would win for X, Y and Z reasons, put it out there was right. Um, What is the value of Scott Adams? What what, what do you think? uh, You know, why is he so appealing to you? And why do you think uh, it's not just you that he actually is one way of thinking about a different way of talking about stuff that might actually bring us together rather than having us kind of at each other's throats all the time? Yeah, I would go as far as saying that he is quietly influencing a country, probably more than we think. It has a lot to do with the powers of persuasion. So he was interested in Donald Trump because he saw a master persuader, a person who could use words uh, to great effect. And so it wasn't that he was a Trump supporter. He just, he was just like, wow, this guy's got game. And he also says, by the way, he says the same thing about AOC, which I agree as well. She has, she has definite uh, skills. And he talks about a, a, a talent stack of being good at a number of things. And I just discovered him by accident because I had uh, read a book by, ah, Jesus, uh, called Influence Mm -hmm. um, by Cialdini. Uh, I can't think of his first name, but let's say his last name's Cialdini. And I I read that book and I thought, wow, this describes Donald Trump to a T. And I don't think Trump was president at the time. So I wrote these articles, three articles, on how Influence predicted Donald Trump and uh, and then some guy on Twitter, and this is where Twitter helps. Some guy goes, "Dude, you should just go read Scott Adams's blog. He just basically covered this six months ago." So I went and I looked, and I go, "Holy crap! Everything that Scott Adams has been talking about for the last I don't know two or three years, I thought I discovered." Hmm. And then I started. He does, and he does this podcast every morning, in which he gets up and he just talks about stuff from a persuasive point of view, and. It's 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 entertaining. It's it's uh, it's it's. I think it's just he's an original thinker, and I find that he rises above the left versus right by talking about what's persuasive, and and also the idea of how to come up with new things as opposed to keep doing the same old thing. And I think you know it's always about questioning, shaking the box. Let's see what happens. Right. And I think it's a uh, it, you know it's he, it's kind of weird how. A lot of his ideas anticipate what happens next, whether it's, it's uh, coupling, you know, or, yeah. uh, or, or or shutting down travel for China. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of eerie things that he predicts. It is. Um, he's also a, an example, as you were saying, about doing new things. Uh, he, he you know, he conducts these podcasts or these interviews or, you know, monologues, really uh, via Periscope. 
And, you know, this is a guy who has a, a massive empire and kind of legacy media through the Dilbert cartoons, but then rushed into new ways of, of being in contact with an audience, which is pretty interesting. Do you yeah. feel that way? I mean, you know, it's funny now uh, you, you are hugely successful. Uh, if I'm right, uh, uh, if I if I believe I'm right, when uh, the Greg Gutfeld show on Fox over the weekend on Fox News over the weekend does better than most other shows, even on, on network shows, much less other cable shows in terms of massive audience. Or do you you're you're a, uh, you know, a kind of em- emissary uh, from le- what's now considered legacy media? Do you see yourself shifting into new modes of interacting with your uh, with your audiences that are different than what you've been doing? I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough question for mm. the last question, Nick. Yes. By the well, way, I'm, I, I, you know, well, let's uh, we did three last questions and I have to go. Uh, I have to go to I got to go to the I got to go to the five. You got to uh, go to the five. Okay. I got to go. go uh, okay. Final, mom. final question for right. Greg Gutfeld, author most recently of The Plus Self Help for People Who Hate Self Help. And I'm going to put you on, on the spot. Sure. Not who do you want to win the presidency, but who do you think is going to win in November? Is it going to be Trump or is it going to be Joe Biden? And I does it matter? I think it's going to be Trump. I, I do. I just don't. I, I, I think that we've got a, a, a lot of people who are pissed off and silent. Hmm. I might be one of them. I don't I'm think you're that silent. No, and not, and I'm now happy. that you're I'm all happy. plus, you're plus, you're happy. You can't be pissed off either. Yeah, you're right. Okay, Sorry. well, we will leave it there. We've been talking with uh, Greg Gutfeld. He's the author most recently, as I said, of The Plus Self-Help for People Who Hate Self-Help. Uh, Greg, thanks so much for talking to Reason. Awesome. Thanks, buddy.